I needed there to be an explosion, so I blew up, uh, fictionally, I fictionally blew up that big mansion um, that's right by Summit. J.J. Hill House? Yeah, J.J. Hill House. Holy... I, blew up, I, blew up, I blew up Hill House. Oh, my God. <laughs> Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I am joined by Naomi Kritzer to talk about her upcoming book, Catfishing on Catnet. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED48. So, Naomi, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be on. So this book, um, Catfishing on Catnet, it's not directly about cats. No. It's not a bunch of cats. Oh, there's a cat in it. Okay. Like an actual cat. Uh, there's an orange cat. Okay. Uh, that uh, the main character um, finds in her bedroom because she left her window open. And uh, she adopts the cat um, and uh, keeps it hidden, doesn't tell her mom that she has it uh, for uh, for a while. Um, and... Uh, there's uh she's never had a cat before so you know she's uh she's not sure like there's all sorts of things about the cat that she's not sure how to deal with mm-hmm. and you know has to ask her online friends for advice about um but uh the, the, this orange cat unlike the majority of orange cats are males so she assumes that this cat is a male it is not a male and has kittens under her bed about a week after she takes it in so um that's a that's a twist yeah <laughs> It's not a major twist. It's just, you know. Well, I mean, from her perspective. Yes, from her perspective, it's a highly inconvenient (laughs) twist. Yes. Uh, So you mentioned online friends, which is a big component of this book. Yes. Um, You want to give us kind of like a high level, broad overview of like what this book is about, what it's doing? So, so the the main character of this book uh, is a girl named Steph and uh, her friends are overwhelmingly online. Um, because Steph moves very frequently. She's, uh, she, her mom is uh, on the run, um, and she rarely gets to you know, spend more than about three months in any, in any place. Um, so she gets to keep the friends that she's made online. Um, and she's, uh, she's on a social network called CatNet, which um, organizes people into like little mini communities within the, within the social network. And her, uh, she's very, very close to some of the people in her little sub network, um, which is called a clouder, uh, in the book. And uh, what she doesn't know um, and finds out early on in the book is that one of her friends in the clouder is actually an artificial intelligence that is running Catnet and is in every single clouder, just presenting itself as one of the members um, and trying to blend in. So there's clouders where people talk about diet and exercise all the time. And, you know, uh, the, the AI participates in those to some degree. And there's clouders where it's teenagers and the AI just lets everybody assume or tells everybody uh, that they're a teenager. And um, so that's uh, uh, things start to heat up when uh, Steph's father um, tracks her down. Um, that's who Steph's mother is on the run from. And the AI is discovered by its own. Well, it's not discovered by its creator, but it gets itself in trouble with its creator and needs to be rescued. Okay. So there's kind of like two different simultaneous problems happening. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're not exactly similar. They're sort of sequential, but yeah. Mo- mm-hmm. Yeah. Everybody's yes. Everybody's dealing with something. Everybody's dealing with something, yeah. So does does anybody actually get catfished in this? Well, or, in it, or is it or is that referencing that the AI is pretending to be a that's person? A reference to the fact that the AI is pretending to be a person. Okay. Um, there is there are references to past incidents. Um, there's a um, there's a reference uh, that I think made it into the final version, but might have just been in the drafts. Uh, there was a past uh, incident where there was somebody in the clouder um, that told a lot of stories about, um, you know traumas and difficulties and try to get people to send her money and Mm -hmm. and this turned out to be largely a lie um any online community is going to have to deal with fabricators sooner or later like that's just inherent to online communities um as far as i've seen there are always always some always someone but um 
because as the saying goes on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's the the main thing that the the title is referring to is the fact that the AI is presenting itself as if it's a teenager, and it's totally not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, it, depending on how long it's existed, right? It mm. might... No, it's actually younger than that. Yeah, exactly. It's a little younger than that. <laughs> yeah. So this setting seems to be like near contemporary. What are like the major differences between our world and that universe? I tried to imagine it as about 10 years out. Okay. Um, although, I mean, obviously any near future setting, there's stuff you're going to imagine existing that yeah, yeah. isn't going to exist. Um, I can't plan 10 years in the future. Yeah, I'm not as I'm not as optimistic about self-driving cars as I was when I wrote this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, although they really come in handy in this story. So I'm glad I used them. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so in this uh, in this world, ten years out, um, there are uh, robots are just being used a lot more. Um, a lot of the te technology in the book is stuff that's been talked about as on the horizon. Mm -hmm. Like self driving cars are there. Um, there's uh, drones um, that do deliveries uh, for online sites. Um, I tried to avoid naming, mostly I tried to avoid naming specific companies because sure. it's such an easy way to date your book, um, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> even by the time it goes to press. So, uh, so I didn't say that the boxes are coming from Amazon, but you know, I mean, Amazon has experimented with delivery drones. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I, there's, um, there's just a uh, sort of more use of robots in general than we see in our society right now, mm -hmm. um, but not a lot more and um, not a lot more sophisticated than what we have for the most part. I'm trying to think what else. Those are that's sort of the that's the biggest I think is the robot. I noticed in the the excerpt that uh, that Tor put out on their website. I think. At, sounds like it's the first chapter um mm -hmm. like in their school they've got several classes that are like being taught by a teacher who's remote um or in the case of the sex ed class like it's it's just a robot that's teaching right sex ed um is and i i can definitely tell you that that kind of thing isn't happening at my school but like I don't know what other schools do. Did you research, do that I, kind of okay. research? I'm pretty sure there are schools out there that are using or at least talking about the sort of the, the, the thing that they do with the calculus class where they yeah. have they have a, a teacher and they use Skype or something. Yeah. And so they have, you know, like the, the four kids at one small town school that are mm -hmm. learning calculus and the four school kids at an, and the teacher can teach them all virtually. I mean, that's just... It's kind of an, an obvious thing to do when you're dealing with really small schools. Yeah. Um, Seems totally are, plausible yeah. in, a, in a remote rural area. Yeah. If they're not using it, doing it now, it's probably more um, because the Skype rooms, like the tele the teleconferencing setup itself is enough of an investment that mm. the schools haven't, you know, put it together yet. Right. Um, the robot teacher is entirely fanciful. I am not aware of anyone doing anything like that. Although back when I was a child, there was all this talk about how, like, you know, we were going to have, you know, robotic online, you know, computer computer aided education was going to be the salvation of us all in yeah. 1985. Like they had this, yeah. <laughs> they had some interesting ideas of how education would work in the future. I mean, right? Yeah. You know. I mean, to be fair, like probably 70% of the stuff that I'm teaching my students, like they could go out and learn on their own by finding all of the information. But like, you know, yeah. the job of the teacher is still to kind of package it up and contextualize it. And there are a lot of really good reasons we haven't gotten rid of teachers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lots. Um, <laughs> although, I mean, like, you know, there's stuff like Khan Academy, which I mean, everyone, yep. everyone I know has who has a kid in high school has had that one class where the kid just wasn't understanding the material during the day, either because, you know, sometimes it was poor instruction, sometimes it was just like that teacher's approach and that kid's learning style were not meshing, um, where they went on Khan Academy and like learned all of algebra mm -hmm. from Khan Academy or whatever. But there's a reason that we don't just eliminate high schools and say, like, go on YouTube. Right. <laughs> lots, right. Of, lots of really good reasons. So... Okay, CatNet itself. Um, yeah. 
in universe is this supposed to be like the equivalent of facebook is it like a huge social mm. network or is it kind of more of a like niche forum kind of thing it's a niche forum okay. so so in my head and this isn't something i actually spelled out on the page but in my head um, part of the backstory of the novel is that the Facebook and Twitter get break in, get broken up. Oh, okay. So that's part of what. So, so we're happening. living in a world where Elizabeth Warren got elected. Yeah, hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not a bad world. So I mean, I, I that's kind of how I'm. That's right. kind of how. It, yeah, but uh, but so so there's. There's more of a variety of social networks in this mm -hmm. world than what we have, where there's just a couple of really big ones. Um, I, I think regardless of whether Facebook gets broken up, I think we're sort of heading in that direction anyway, because so many teens view Facebook. One should hope. Yeah. yeah, but teens tend to, a lot of teens view Facebook the way I view LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you're you, you're you kind of have to be on it for reasons, but it doesn't mean you would do it for fun. Right. It's really not a social network. It's it's like a business. Now. It's where your mom is. Um, yeah. Even so, though, like all of these teenagers, from what I can see, are like super into like all of the all the places where they like the online spaces where they hang out are like these super centralized. Um, and nowadays, yeah. like mobile only platforms. Yeah, that's um, true. Which is something that like now I'm showing my age. I'm like, man, can we just have some like decentralized like, yeah. you know, like yeah. can we all get on Mastodon, please? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so the 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 origin story of Catnet was in, it was in the first draft. So there's a short story I wrote um, that this that this or originated from called um, Cat Pictures, Please, which is told entirely from the viewpoint of the AI. Um, uh, and it's you know it's a conscious AI. It wants cat pictures and uh, and it wants to help people. And it has a very unique has a has a. Uh, an approach to helping people that is, you know, yields mixed results. Right. So, um, but that, that was a very good short story. Oh, I you. listened to it the other day. Thank you. Uh, so at the end of the short story, the AI announces that it is going to start a dating site because it knows everything about you and therefore it definitely knows which human you should be romantically involved with. Fair. Um, so... In the, in the section I had to take out because my editor was like, your readers won't care, uh, the AI explains to the reader that it tried to run a dating site. And the problem was that humans are so weird that you could provide one human with another human that met every single one of the specifications that human said it wanted in a, like, a romantic partner. And they'd go on a date, and four hours later, they'd be texting all their friends saying, no chemistry, no spark. <laughs> like, it was this, – this person was exactly within the height, weight, interest parameters that you specified, and yet you didn't like them? What's wrong with you? Um, so what the, what the AI concludes is that it's really good at finding people friends. Okay. And because with friendships, like, we have a lot of shared interests and attitudes is usually enough. Mm -hmm. Um, but romance is just complicated and humans are weird and it's just not going to try to do that anymore. So it, it thought Catnet was going to be a dating site and instead it turned into a friendship site. And which isn't as hard a turn as like what YouTube did. Right. Cause that well, used to be a dating yes, site too. <laughs> yes, I know. And that was part of what I was thinking about was that YouTube thought it was a dating site. So the idea that you create you create a you create a site on the internet and you think it's for one thing and then it's really not you're totally wrong about what you created that's not new um that's been a, that's been true of the that's been true of the social networks and the you know and youtube yeah. so so uh yeah so that's the that the this that's the you know that's the origin story of the network itself in the book which you know in the book it's just presented is this thing it exists every you know not everybody knows about it you know it's a niche it's mm -hmm. probably more like you know like maybe a little like mastodon maybe a, a little like it you know. seems to me kind of like discord you know? yeah yeah okay it's it's more like discord than anything else probably yeah so like i'd like to talk about that like the concept of all these little group chats um mm -hmm. the clouders First of all, where did that word come from? What does that mean? Oh, it, uh, okay. So you know how there's like fancy words in English for groupings of different animals? Like oh, a murder no. of ravens? Yeah. Clouder of cats. <laughs> so that's why. 
<laughs> well, I learned something new today. <laughs> That's so, very good. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, so, like, I mean, I, I totally see that as, like, a, a plausible uh, setup for, you know, a, a yeah. social network, especially, like, you know, it, that seems to be kind of the direction that we're going. So in 10 years mm-hmm. from now, like, um, was 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 the reasoning for doing that, was that more of, like, a plot device for you? Or was that, like, in, you know, thinking about in-universe, like, what would happen here? It was a mix of the two. Um, because in universe, I thought it made a lot of sense for the AI to sort of, you know, pull out groupings of people who had particularly hit it off. Mm -hmm. Um, because I mean, I've found communities like this online, um, but it takes a lot of looking and think how nice it would be if an all knowing artificial intelligence was like, oh, you will really hit it off with these people and usually was correct. Yeah. The friendship matchmaker. The friendship matchmaker. And not just one-on-one, but a group French, you know, because, you know, like with friendship, you can have like, you know, 10 or ten or 15 or 20 people that hang out regularly online and it works out pretty well. Uh, so that that's that was one piece of it. And there was also just the fact that uh, it needed to be a limited, just for the plot, it needed to be a limited group mm-hmm. um, or there would be too many characters to keep track of. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So. And like, yeah, this kind of, kind of, core community is definitely possible in a mm-hmm. you know in a platform like twitter that's like technically completely open and you yeah know, but then you know like 95 percent of the time that i'm like interacting with people on twitter it's folks from you know st paul or, or minneapolis yeah. who are like in the urbanist sphere so the thing about twitter that's really fascinating is that it most of the time you're talking to your friends mm-hmm. and that it's really easy to feel like that's what you're doing is just talking to your friends and uh, there's a, another science fiction writer, Mary Robin at Cole, who has this wonderful, um, you know, description. She said, uh, Twitter, you're having a conversation with your friends while standing in front of a microphone that could go live at any second without warning. <laughs> and so you never know, like, you'll say this thing, this you'll make this clever joke to your friend and your friend's like, oh, that's really clever. And like, before you know it, it turns out the microphone was on. Right. And it's like a podcast. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's an aspect of that's an aspect of Internet life that I don't try to grapple with in this book. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's definitely a thing. So being that this book is about teens interacting online um, mm-hmm. and that seems to be something that a lot of adults don't understand very well um, or at least self-purport to not understand very well right mm-hmm. um, I mean you know I work at a high school and like sometimes I feel like I don't have a good grasp so yeah. you don't seem to be a teenager uh, how did you go about grappling with this I was an online teenager in the stone age <laughs> in 1990 wow. I participated in a chat room which I dialed up to at 2400 baud with a modem. Um, was that before the World Wide Web came out? Yes, this when? was before the World okay. Wide Web. So World Wide Web uh, was implemented in 1993. Okay, yeah. So we're talking billboard? But we're talking BBSs, bu- bulletin board bulletin systems. Boards. Bulletin board systems. Um, but also a chat line, which was a live chat um, where everybody, it was all local. Um, this was based in Madison, Wisconsin, where I grew up. It was called the B-Line. Okay. And... Uh, it was uh, it was a local um, text based chat line where people used handles and had mostly inane, but you know, <laughs> like I mean, uh, when the Gulf War broke out, like the first mm. thing I did was like log on to my online community and talk about it with people, and we were like, and, and as it happened that night, people were like. We want to we want to see each other in person. So I went out like past the normal time my parents would normally have let me go out on a school night, but they were like, "Yeah, we we understand why you want to do this." Uh, we all met up at a Perkins, and uh, like sat Wait, around. Parents in 1990 saying, "Yeah, we understand. You want to go and meet some random strangers from the internet from oh. from online." So so yeah so okay. This is funny. Uh, so in 1990, right, I was in high school. My sister was in middle school, and she was also using this chat line. The first one of us who wanted to meet somebody from the B-Line was actually my sister, um, who had a friend on the B-Line uh, who wanted to get together with her, who was also, like, she was 13, and he was a 13-year-old boy. And my mom was like, 
how do you know this isn't a 40-year-old man? Which is a good question Mm -hmm. to ask. And at the time, this was a small enough community that my answer was, if he was a th- if he was a forty year old man, I would have I would have heard, because people on this in this group did get together on the regular okay. enough uh-huh. that I was like I asked around I was like is this is this actually a kid or is it a creepy adult and people were like, no oh, he's a middle schooler so I I told my mom this and she was like I don't trust your sources, so she allowed Abby to meet this guy but. She had to bring my mother along. Uh-huh. And my, my sister was like, I am going to literally die of embarrassment, mom. And mom was like, I'll stay out of sight. So my mother literally hid behind a kiosk on Madison State Street while Abby met up with another 13-year-old and they went to the arcade. <laughs> and once mom had gotten a look at him and was like, oh, yeah, that's a 13-year-old. She just left. I mean, it was fine. But it was, uh, you know, th- we were asking. I mean, th- these questions were real and they, mm-hmm. they were they mattered. Um, I met up with, um, some of these people were people I already knew in person. So, I mean, some of them were friends of mine from my high school. Um, but, uh, I also met up with, uh, a boy, um, who had gone to my high school and, uh, we, uh, but was now a student at the local university. We got together and we did exactly the same things that are sort of the best practices for online dating. And, you know, we met in a public place. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I scoped him out by asking people if they knew anything about him, um, and got, you know, heard that, you know, people believed him to be like a harmless nerd. Um, (laughs) and, uh, uh, yeah. So, I mean, it was, uh, we were, we were figuring out the rules that a few years later, everyone, you know, everyone agreed were sort of the a good yeah, idea, yeah. especially the meet in a public place the first time. Like everyone, everyone did that, you know, in 1990 um, on this, in this community, if we were getting together. And there were these big group get togethers at places like a Perkins. I mean, it was, um, that was a, uh, that was a very public environment. So yeah. it was, it felt pretty, you know, I think my parents felt pretty safe letting me go off to that. Yeah. And these days you have a little bit more of like a, you know, somebody's digital footprint to kind of you know scope out as well yeah. and it's, um you know it, it's not 100 percent foolproof of course but like yeah i i got uh a carpool with another person to uh one of hank and john green's like live shows over in milwaukee right you know mm-hmm. i just randomly asked people like in the twin cities nerd fighters group like anybody mm-hmm. want a carpool and like you know um she scoped out like you know my my facebook account my twitter account and was like there's no way that somebody would be able to like put this much effort consistently for this many years mm-hmm. into like pretending to be this guy. I guess that she felt yeah. comfortable like saying, yeah. "Yeah, yeah, I'll drive you to Milwaukee." <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, the 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 things that I I tend to look for when I'm trying to scope somebody out online, um, I look for the chain of real people. Is mm-hmm. one of the things. So, oh, like, okay. if I've never met them, but I've met somebody who's met them, mm-hmm. or if I've met somebody who's met somebody who's met them, it's the people where no one's ever met them that I yeah. tend to be, uh-huh. or the only people who are vouching for them, nobody's ever met them. Like, that makes me a whole lot warier, um, and not not in the sense of avoiding serial killers, even more in the sense of like you know, <sighs> sussing out whether the really dramatic story you're hearing is true or entirely fabricated. Mm -hmm. Um, There have been a couple of really dramatic online. um, There's, there was an incident, my God, like 15, 10, 15 years ago involving uh, a blogger who blogged as gay girl in Damascus. Okay. Turned out to be a straight guy in Virginia. Okay. Something like that. And uh, um, that was, uh, that got me thinking about the, the various like, internet liars I had mm-hmm. run into. Um, and that the chain of real people is one of those things that, um, I mean, there are people who avoid it for good reasons is the thing. So, I mean, it's just, it's not foolproof in any case. But, right, right. Um, yeah. I mean, for all you know, you might have come over here to record a podcast and, you know, maybe my show is all about like slamming authors for, you know, their dumb <laughs> books. And This <laughs> is true. It could happen. Um, I, uh, I mean... If you'd been a serial killer, I mean, I, I like told my husband I was going over to somebody's house to record a podcast and you sent me your address. So, you know, right. I figured probably not a serial killer. <laughs> uh, but yes, no, that's true. It's, this could be like a mean prank and I wouldn't have known. Mm-hmm. You just 
you know. I mean, that's the other thing is, is that there's a there's a certain degree to which, you know, most of us assume that the people we interact with are going to abide by, like, the social contract in way, you know, in, in one way or another. And, um, you know. And so many of the times when. Usually we're right. Yeah. And, and so many of the times when, like, somebody doesn't, it's it's often just like because the social contract like two people think of the social contract in different ways that's and true. it's you know it's not always intentional yeah, yeah that's true uh, I, I was gonna say uh regarding teenagers today online um uh-huh. i i'm not gonna say that i totally understand um like snapchat <laughs> right right i mean there's there's like i mean there's no Whatever current technology the kids are using, when, once the adults figure it out, I think the kids usually move on. Sure. So yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. just part of the joy of things like TikTok is that the grownups don't don't get it. I, man, I made a reference to TikTok the other day in my classes, uh-huh. and like I expected to get like a positive response because what I have heard is like all the teenagers are all over TikTok, yeah. and and they were all largely like eleventh graders. They were like. Mr. Buck, no. And I'm like, wait, wait, what's wrong with TikTok? Wait, tell me, you guys. And, and they were like, junior hires are into TikTok. Oh, God. And I'm like, oh, okay. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. I, I, uh, this is part of why I made up all the pop culture in this book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all the pop, pretty much all the pop culture, not all, but most of the pop culture referenced in this book is, um, was I just made it up completely because mm-hmm. I was like that way I can say it's cool and nobody's gonna be like you think that's cool? Did you Boomer. do did you do anything fun like referencing a piece of pop culture from today and like the kids are like oh my god that's so <laughs> old? No, I didn't because that's I mean that's an, it's sort of like listing mentioning like it's sort of like mentioning um, uh, businesses like you just uh-huh. you know it, it's 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 a little it's a little risky. So I, I had them, um, you know, I made up a show called Fast Girls Detective Agency that's like vaguely Charlie's Angels-ish. Okay. There's lots of explosions and car chases. And I... everyone really, really liked it when they were nine. And now they're a little embarrassed at how fanish they were. And like, you know, and I, there's all, like, there's a whole bunch of like, I mean, they talk about fanfic for it and like the the music that's associated with it. <laughs> and like, at one point they meet one of the, um, Steph and her her close friend Rachel uh, have to go on a road trip to rescue the AI, and they end up staying the night with somebody they know from the clouder, who turns out to be a little bit younger than them, and she's still really into it. I mean, it's just like, and I, because it was like it wasn't a real piece of pop culture. I mean, it could be whatever I needed it to yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I am so into like in-universe tv shows that are just like way over the top i mean it's it's, (laughs) like by the end i really wanted this show to exist it sounds really fun (laughs) to me like i mean it's like a an an, a a detective show but with four women um and uh lots of car chases what's not to like there you go i don't know car chases give me some anxiety nowadays oh Yeah. Okay. So we've been talking a lot about like social aspects of the internet. Are there any like specific like social implications of technology that the book explores? So the 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 things that I would say the book um, really gets into in that regard are online friendships and the the fact that they're you know they're real friendships. Right. Um, so that's one one thing that the book uh, that I that I thought about a lot with the book. Um, and one of the other things I thought about a bit is privacy, uh, online privacy. Um, and that's something that's not, I mean, it's not, in the book, it is sort of a constant background problem that the kids are struggling with. Because Steph is, you know, Steph and her mother are hiding from somebody. Right. So Steph has to be very, very, very careful with her online footprint. Um, and her friends are not in the same habits as her. And that is part of how she winds up being found um Mm. and there's just a lot um and like the the ways in which um i mean i talked a bunch about um i talked about sort of the different the different ways in which uh in which you leave footprints when you go places online not because i'm like trying to educate the teens but because it mattered in the plot um but it wound up being a pretty significant theme in the book was sort of the 
like what people can see you doing and like what they can use that information for. And I mean, um, you know, we've all had the experience of like, you know, you look up one thing and then ads for it follow you around for the next six months, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, the AI can see everything you're doing online. And of course, instead of using it to market to you, the AI is trying to manipulate you to do things that are, you know, that it considers to be in your better interests. Um, but uh, the AI also always knows where Steph is, despite all her mother's care in hiding her, um, because it, you know, it just has access to, it has access to more, more things online than a, a, a random individual, even a very savvy one is going to have access to. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And definitely better for the AI to have access to her location at all times than her father. Oh yeah. No, I mean, (laughs) if her father had had access to her location at all times, like this would have been a very short story. Right. Right. (laughs) And, and, you know, that is a thing that, that people are struggling with right now is, you know, I've, I've read a lot about like, um, apps that are being like, you know, taken down from the Google play store and the app store, Mm -hmm. you know, because like they, uh, like that that is like their sole purpose is to enable yeah. one person to control another person's life by like you know yeah well there's a um there's an app called um life three sixty mm-hmm. um which is a literally a tracking app um and the way it is generally used is that parents want their teenagers to have it on their phone so that if you're not home yeah. by your curfew they can see where you are yeah yeah um <clears throat> so uh I mean, in the theory, I mean, it's 360, which means that it goes in all directions. Um, and there are teenagers who have it on their phones who use it to figure out whether their mom is still at the store. Because if she is, you can say, hey, pick up marshmallows. We're out yeah. of marshmallows. Um, and it's it's one of these things that can be really benign or really creepy. And it depends a lot on the family di- dynamics. Right, right. Um, and uh, there was an article about it. Like two weeks ago, um, there was an article in like the Washington Post, maybe, uh, about this that talked about college students whose parents have Life 360 on their phone and use it to make sure that their teenager is going home and studying on Friday nights and not going out to party. Right. And like really using it in ways that are wildly inappropriate um, rather than like cutting the apron strings. Um, and it and it was they it was a good article because they talked both about the aspect of like teenagers who were in college now, but we're still not able to experience any of the freedom of college right, because right. of their parents using spy technology on them. And then the flip of this were the, the parents who, instead of like learning to manage their anxiety, <laughs> were using this app uh-huh. as constant reassurance that their child was safe. And I'm like, yeah, see, when I went away to college, my mom had to just figure it out. Like yeah. she, she no longer could keep tabs on me. I was at college. That's where she knew I was. She knew she knew I was at college and that had to be okay. And like that was really better for her than if she could like check her app 20 times a day to see yeah. exactly where I was. That would not have been healthy for her or for me. Um so the that those apps are also discussed in this. Um and there's uh there's one character who has a, a cheap one who has also downloaded downloaded an app that feeds false data into it. Oh sure, yeah. Um <laughs> and then uh, and then there's an, um, the, the father, um, the scary father is abusing his current partner and she has an app on her phone that tracks her so that he mm-hmm. knows where he is, okay. where she is so that he can control her. Okay. So there you go. So yeah. it, it, it's in the book. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, most of my family, sh- we share our locations with each other on like Google maps. Mm-hmm. But like when, when I got into this, you know, of course I was the first one to like find out about this feature and, you know, yeah, like I made sure that like everybody in the family who is setting this up, that it was mutually consensual, you know, that yeah. it wasn't just like, you know, cause yeah. I've done, I've done whack things. Like I share my location with Hank green on Google maps and it's like, <laughs> There is no reason, like, there's no way that that's reasonable, right? Right. Um, and one of the results is that uh, I've almost been doxxed in front of an entire group, like, audience of people because he pulled up Google Maps, like, at a live show or whatever. And, like, well, okay, that's, I, huh. I get what I asked for, I guess. <laughs> Interesting. I didn't, okay, I didn't even know you could share your location with, like, random people. Oh, yeah, as long as you have their email address. Oh, my God. Okay, that's... That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. I will say, but similarly, uh, I, um, 
when I, I got my new phone, it downloaded a, a bunch of phone numbers for my contacts. Okay. And there was one that I pulled up and I was like, okay, this is an editor at a publishing house. It's the publishing house I'm with now. Mm-hmm. This was an editor at Tor. But at the time, I did not have a professional connection to Tor. Mm-hmm. Um, and I looked at this and I was like, okay, like I have his email address. I cannot imagine he wants me to have his phone number. Mm-hmm. And I, like... And I, I feel sufficiently uncomfortable about this that I don't even feel like I can dial this phone number and say, hey, I bet you don't want me to have this, <laughs> seeing as I'm a random person who you barely know. Right. Uh, so I actually told a mutual friend, you should let so-and-so know that, like, I don't know how he's, like, how... I don't know how Google got his phone number, but apparently it did. And now it's, like, listed as my contacts, and I... I can't imagine that's something that he would want. Yeah, I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, no, I'll let him know. I wonder if that was like a side effect of Google Plus. Probably. Because, yeah, like Probably. that tied into people's mm-hmm. contact lists. Yes. In ways that like I was paying attention and I knew exactly like where yeah. all of my contact information was going. But it's not super obvious to everybody. No, I suspect that is where it came from. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I... Uh, <laughs> Rest in peace, Google Plus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here's something that I noticed while I was reading the the excerpt uh that's been published online. Um I came across the line, the closest thing that they had to real food is two slightly dried out oranges in a basket near the register and some sort of locally packaged granola with a picture of a chalkboard and guarantee to make you poop in cursive writing across it. And I almost moved past that line and then I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Was that crapola? (laughs) I was not expecting anyone to recognize that (laughs) reference, but yeah, um, that was certainly what I was picturing. I I, I was not like looking at a package of it when I described it, but... um, you know, and I was thinking about like food I've seen in like small town grocery stores. Yeah. That's food I've seen in small town grocery stores usually when I'm on my way north. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I don't actually know where it comes from. For for people, yeah. So I actually had to look it up as well. I was like, I know this is like a local thing, but I don't remember where it's Ely. Is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah see, I'm usually on my way to Ely when I see it. So, yep. I mean, you know, <laughs> this way, they're way out of the area. I mean, because I think this is somewhere between like... This is this is that was when they were leaving Thief River. Oh, Falls OK. And so, yeah. And they hadn't made it to the Twin Cities okay. yet, I think, or something like that. I guess it's not that far. I mean, it's it's a ways from Ely. I don't know how widespread it is. But. Right. I mean, like I've lived in St. Paul my whole life and I'm aware of Crapola. OK. I don't know. I don't think I've ever bought it, but like I know <laughs> what it is. It. <laughs> I've not bought it. <laughs> It was one of those things that I was, I, I mean, I was totally picturing Crapola and I did not, you know, I did not specify that's what I was talking about. But I think part of my brain was thinking, well, this could exist multiple places, right? I right. mean, this could be a yeah. thing. But, but it's, it's also, probably just Crapola. It's a it's a delightful little local reference. Yeah. It's, I love it. <laughs> yeah. And that was one thing that I, as I was reading that chapter, you know, like so many times when people like read a book that's set in like the city where they live or whatever and they're like oh my gosh like the author did such a good job of like you know capturing all this and i was like okay we're driving through uh rural minnesota right and like (laughs) you know which is a thing that i've done a few times Mm -hmm. and so i was like looking for little things that like i might recognize and stuff and um and then they got over into wisconsin i'm like okay i have no idea where this is anymore It's not that different, except that suddenly there's like wine and beer at all the gas stations in yeah. vast quantities because yeah. there's no restrictions on where you can sell it. I uh, I drove to Wisconsin, to Madison, Wisconsin, a couple weekends ago, and on the way home we stopped at a gas station and there was you know a huge wine section, and I was like, this is <laughs> this is so foreign to me as a Minnesotan. <laughs> yeah, I am. Um... I did notice because I was like following along on the map as, as oh. we went. I was like, mm-hmm. Osseo, okay, yep, there it is. And and of course, like the, the town that they moved to is a fictional town. It right? is a fictional yeah. town. Um, I, I'm glad that I didn't fail to find a real town on the map. <laughs> yeah, I used I used sort of standard Wisconsin naming conventions, which mm-hmm. is a new new version of a city in Germany. Okay. There's a town somewhere in Germany called Coburg. So okay. New Coburg is a very plausible but non, non-existent Wisconsin yeah. town. It is... Very roughly, like any time I was like, would a town this size have a thing? I would look at Nielsville, Wisconsin. Okay. So okay. it's more or less 
where Nielsville is, but it's not. It's based on Nielsville only in the sense of like when I wanted to know if this town would have a Walmart, I looked at Nielsville to see if Nielsville would have a Walmart, if Nielsville had a Walmart. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I was very amused to find that, like, okay, depending on which direction they went from I-94, like, they were about the right distance away to be in Greenwood, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. which is, like, where my wife's grandparents live. And so I've been out there, so, oh. like, quite a few times. <laughs> like, I didn't tell my writer. I have a writer's group that I, I meet with, like, every other week. Uh -huh. And uh, they, you know, they got to read this section by section as I worked on it. Um and at some point, long after I had like picked Nielsville as the model, I mentioned that I had used Nielsville. And Lida was Lida, one of the people in my writers group, was like, "Wait, it's Nielsville? Because she, it's where her grandparents live." Nice. So I mean, <laughs> you know, um, it, and it's not Nielsville. It is just that I used Nielsville if I needed to know, like, you know, right? What a you know what a high how big would the high school be? Mm -hmm. Like things like that. I did not grow up in a small town. I had a couple of people who did grow up in a small town read the manuscript because I was like, I am sure I made like some really dumb mistakes. And I did, in fact. Um and my friend Elise was like, Here, let me uh let me suggest uh, you know, some alternatives. Right. Things that you would find in a small town. So the short story cat pictures please mm -hmm. um is like they're, they're in the same universe it's the same ai that exists in both of them um how like directly does the novel follow from from that obviously it's not a required reading for people who want to read the no. book but no definitely not you know the story wanted hugo and i was able to find an agent for the first time in quite a while after i won the award and uh she she shopped around like the manuscript that I had and um and there was an editor who asked if I had ever thought about turning the short story into a YA novel specifically a YA novel so the manuscript that you had wasn't the what? the manuscript she was shopping around was what was YA ish at least mm -hmm. but um, but it wasn't catfish but it wasn't this okay it wasn't this um and uh, an editor was like we would be you know we would be interested if she wants to write a proposal in a YA novel that with this, you know, from, you know, on a similar premise. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay. And I thought about it and I was like, okay, so obviously if the AI is a character, I mean, this is a story about online life. This is a story about like, you know, living your life, having your social life online in various important ways. And who would be the teenager who, really truly lived online and, and there were various answers and the one that i thought would be interesting um was this the teenager who had a parent that moved them constantly so mm -hmm. they never got to they had no real world stability their stability all came from their online community um and the story sort of like came from that came from that um the ai character is I think pretty consistent from one to the other, like in my head, at least it's, it's very much the same person, mm -hmm. um, similar attitude towards the world, similar desire to be helpful, similar, um, similar sort of approach to analyzing stuff. Um, and that's the main piece that's like the same from one to the other. Um, I don't really think of the, um, I mean, I guess, I guess in a sense, because I, I like, I did think about how, the dating site turned into catnet it does flow but mm -hmm. you know it does but it doesn't yeah so um is so if somebody wants to get like a sense for whether or not they're going to enjoy catfishing is is cat pictures please a good place to start or i mean yeah it would it would be yeah i mean it, it it's a low commitment place to start for sure you know right. you, you can read that story in about 15 minutes it's yeah. short um and uh you know, read read cat pictures, please. And if you like if you like the narrator and you think I would like to spend more time with this character, then yeah. Um, there's also ex you know there's the excerpt online, so you know yes. you can look up the mm -hmm. book and see if you you know if you. And I'll put links to. I think there's like two different excerpts. Uh, okay. One one on Tor's website and one on another. Okay. Uh, and one of them is from Steph's perspective, and one of them is the AI's perspective. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so look in the show notes for those, uh, listener.
So you mentioned that you ha already have the sequel written? Yeah, uh, that's not mm -hmm. uncommon. It takes a really long time for a book to get published. Right. So I turned this in and they started, once I'd finished the edits, um, I started writing the sequel. And that I turned in to my editor in July. Okay. Um, and I have not yet gotten back her um, editorial notes on it. So I'm definitely going to be doing rewriting, which means that of the things that I think of as being in the sequel, it is hard to know how many of them will make it to the end. <laughs> right, right. Um, because, you know, rewriting is a thing. But yes. Obviously, you can talk about that even less than you can talk about right. catfishing, which hasn't come out yet. Yeah. Is is there anything about the sequel that you want to say? Well, it takes place in Minneapolis. Ooh! Yeah. The whole book takes place. Uh, well, there's there's some bits where they leave, uh -huh. um, but it's they're living in Minneapolis in the nice. second book. And um, there are a number of real world locations which might or might not make it to the final version. Um, the funniest of which is probably um, Can Can Wonderland is in it. But nice. in, in this future, it has been bought by somebody who has added on to it um, uh, an indoor amusement park. So there's this okay. artist designed roller coaster in the book. Oh. I don't know if it will make it to the final product. And it is possible that my editor will be like, um, this could get us sued, so it can't be Can Can Wonderland. You <laughs> right. have to change it to something that doesn't exist. We'll if, see. If you have to change it, mm -hmm. it could be the Ham's Brewery over on the oh. east side. Because I have seen Ooh. some like concept renderings of like the person who founded Can Can Wonderland yeah. wants to buy it and they want to like build a crazy amusement park looking thing with like yeah, like like oh big God. giant okay. slides and Oh, okay, wow. Yeah, maybe I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ham Ham Wonderland or whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's it's like it's like owned by somebody in the, in the story. It's owned by 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 somebody who's not very nice. Yeah, so I okay. mean, obviously okay. not the current owners, right? Who are, as far as I know, lovely people. Mm -hmm. um, but. That's uh, good. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Other real world locations that I, uh, let's see. Oh, in the second book. And again, we'll see if this makes it to the final version, but uh, I needed there to be an explosion. So I blew up uh, in, like in the, in the fictionally, I fictionally um, blew up that big mansion um, that's right by Summit. Uh, that's right, right on um... JJ Hill House. Yeah, JJ Hill House. Holy... I blew up. I blew up. I blew up Hill House. Oh my God! <laughs> and before I blew up Hill House, I, I ran this by a friend whose wife um, is a is a uh, employee of the State Historical Society, and I said, uh -huh. "Will she be mad at me if I blow up Hill House?" And the response was, "No, <laughs> go for it." <laughs> So, I mean, obviously she would not want it blown up in the real life right, world, right, but right, right. fictionally, fictionally, she thought that was perfectly fine. Oh so, my God. So Hill House gets, gets, gets blown sky high. And, uh, uh, and then the other, the other real world location that shows up is Powderhorn Park. Okay. So. Uh huh. Honestly. Oh my God. If, if the James J. Hill House like got blown up, that would be devastating for me. It's a really pretty building. I oh would, yeah, I would be really sad if it got if it got destroyed. But I I needed something. I needed something impressive and landmarky. And, yeah, you know. And it was one where I could uh, the um, the AI with the help of a robot that it had um, you know ordered from uh, the robots. There's there's an actual like robot that gets multiple little robots that get carried around and used in the second book. Mm -hmm. And if you've seen those videos of the robot dogs. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, like the cheetah models or whatever they're yeah. called. Uh -huh. It's based on that, but like imagined if like they were selling it to the consumer market. So it's like okay. chihuahua size. Okay. Uh, so the um, the the AI has ordered one of those and has it shipped to Steph. And then when the first one gets destroyed, like simply has it replaced uh -huh. <laughs> immediately. Um, so it, it has one of these to use to like move through the physical world. Oh, okay. And it uses that to like, it realizes what's going to happen. It goes running over to Hill House and like... And like um, pulls the fire alarm <laughs> to get everybody to leave so that no one is injured in the destruction of this this um, noted historical monument. Right. It's always funny thinking about like, you know, the fictional universes where they always choose some landmark to like blow up or whatever to like, you know, make it really impactful. And yeah. like for me, you know, like. I'm just going to pull, okay, the American Godzilla movie out, right? Mm -hmm. You know, which I watched quite a few times when I was a kid, you know, and they always like, all right, blow up Madison Square Garden. And of course, me living in St. Paul, that means nothing to me. Right. You know, even though Madison Square Garden is a very large sports stadium, you know, yeah. and like a lot of people know where that is. I had no idea. Yeah. But like, man, hearing like James J. Hillhouse is going to get blown up, like, 
wow, that means a lot to me. It's... Right. <laughs> hard to know. Hard to know how well it'll work for like the non Minnesotans that will hopefully read the book. Right. Um, including my editor who lives in New York City. Um... <laughs> So I've got a couple of questions from uh, people who responded to me online. Okay. Um, Ryan R- Ricard, Rickard, uh, who goes by Firewally on Twitter, uh, he says that he absolutely loved Cat Pictures, Please. Uh, and he, when he heard that you were making it into a novel, it struck him that there, may, that there are many places that you could have gone with it. Um, mm-hmm. So how did you start narrowing it down to, like, for example, why young adult? Well, I guess we covered that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, why this particular character. uh... Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. So it needed, I think I I talked about this some earlier. It needed to be a book about like online community. Mm -hmm. And so it needed to be a character for whom online community would be really, really important and really pivotal. Um, And there are various reasons why that might be true of somebody. Um, But for a lot of them, you know, it doesn't really lend itself to a story, to a, an exciting storyline, <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, I mean, I was a kid for whom an online social life was important. And in part, that was because I was nerdy and lonely and um, had trouble connecting to, like, my classmates. Um, and finding other nerds online was really empowering and exciting. Um, and that's a storyline I think a lot of people are familiar with. Um, And that's a storyline that usually goes, you know, and eventually high school ends and I graduated and went to college. Presumably your personal story isn't as exciting as Steph's story. Yeah. No, thank goodness. Um, (laughs) um, And yeah, so the the, the, she needed she needed a reason to be online that would lend itself to um, like a a story that was more um, a story that would be like that would have some action. Mm -hmm. Um, not every YA novel has action. Some of them are very, are very much just about like, you know, friendships and relationships and so on. But, Mm -hmm. um, when it's science fiction, you know, people who pick up science fiction usually want, um, want, you know, want, want some action. So yeah, so Steph, uh, Steph had a backstory where her mom was on the run and I thought, I mean, there were various possibilities I thought about, including that, um, that her mom was on the run, but didn't really need to be that, you know, that her mom was delusional, that her mom was, you know, believed that they were, you know, that her father was out to get them, but he wasn't, Mm -hmm. um, that her mother was hiding something else. Like I went through a lot of possibilities, um, and tried to find one that would fit, um, that would fit the, that would fit the characters, Um, and who they sort of were turning into as I was writing them. Um, like I wasn't sure who the mom was when I started writing. Mm -hmm. Um, but as I wrote her, like she, she fairly swiftly turned into somebody who was like doing her best under a difficult situation. Like she wasn't, she's not always a, she's not always a great mom. Um, but she's trying to keep Steph safe Mm -hmm. and, can't um doesn't feel like she can share some of the full details of what's going on with Steph. I had uh, a question from Nancy Dawkin which is not related to the book specifically but um she wanted to know what three habits help you the most to succeed at writing. Hmm. So uh when I'm working um when I'm writing a new manuscript of, of a novel length project um the thing that I find most helpful to get through it is to write every day. And this is hard. Um, but if I can at least open up the manuscript and add even a sentence, even on a really bad day, the next day it is easier to sit down and get more words. Um, so, so that's the first thing. Um, and that's been true as long as I've been writing novels. My very first novel I wrote in... Wow, like 1999, I think was when I wrote it. Okay. Wow. Um, and I, or maybe it was 98. Anyway, I wrote it. And like once I actually disciplined myself to sit down and work on it every single day, um, even just a tiny bit, it got done a lot faster than I had expected. Um, so so that's, the, that's, that's my really big one. Um, the other things uh, that I found really helpful 
Um, I joined a writing group years ago, like back in 1997, um, and I've been in it ever since. Uh, we meet every two weeks, more or less, and uh, and getting the regular getting regular feedback was really really helpful to me. Um, writers groups are mixed bag. Um, this one this one was very has been very very helpful to me though. So. Um, and then almost like an AI placed you with all these other people. Right. <laughs> and then, uh, let's see, what would be a third? When I wrote my first novel and I still often think of long stories this way, like I'm, a, I tend to be a plotter rather than a pantser. There's, there's sort of two terms that are used. Plotters like have an, you know, like outlining, they like figuring out where the story's going uh -huh. from the beginning. Pantsers are just like seat of their pants, like sit down and oh, see where okay. the story takes them. Okay. I tend to be more of a plotter, um, but I don't try to plot the whole story at once. I try to have an idea of the overall arc, and then I have sort of these sort of like way stations, these really big scenes um, that I'm sort of like, you know, the, the big pivotal scenes that where like, you know, something blows up or somebody dies or whatever. Um, so I'm writing, I'm writing towards those, those big scenes. And when I get to one, I sort of plot out the next section. Um, and that, that's been, that's been a technique that has worked well for me over the years. Okay. So this book Comes out November nineteenth. Yes. Um, available in all the different formats: print, ebook, audiobook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, people can find it just about anywhere. Yep, should be able to find it just about anywhere. Uh, you know, in the Twin Cities, the Uncle Hugo's in Dreamhaven will have it. Majors and Quinn will have it. I think most of the other bookstores will have it as well. Mm -hmm. um, if they don't, they should be able to order it for you, no problem. Um, yeah. And you know, of course, you can order it online. Mm -hmm. Um, any book related events that people should know about? Yeah. So on Thursday, November 21st, uh, Majors and Quinn, 7 to 8 p.m., I will be reading with Sue Burke and Marissa Lingen. And we will be signing afterwards, um, doing Q&A and signing as well. On Friday, November 22nd, uh, I will be appearing at The Loft in Minneapolis in conversation with Kelly Barnhill. That runs from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Um it is a ticketed event, um, and you can buy tickets in advance if you prefer. And uh, that's going to be more like uh, like the podcast where I'm like chatting with somebody about okay. like the book and work and whatever. On Saturday, November 23rd, I will be signing at Uncle Hugo's Science Fiction Bookstore from 1 to 2 p.m. But yeah, if people uh, if people hear this um, before from further away than Minneapolis and want a signed copy. Uncle Hugo's actually has a page where you can put in an order and tell them that you want it signed. And even if you want it personalized, so, you know, um, you know, to so-and-so, whatever. Um, so you just put that in when you buy it and they will have me sign it when I am there for the signing and then they will ship it to you. That's a good deal. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then finally, where can people find you on the internet? Um, my website is naomikritzer.com and I am on Twitter at at Naomi Kritzer. So those are probably the main. Oh, I also have an Instagram, which uh -huh. I use entirely for cat pictures. Nice. It's Naomi Crit, and it's nothing but cat, almost nothing but cat pictures. <laughs> on brand. <laughs> it, well, this is the great thing about having cat pictures be on brand for me. Like, I never get tired of taking pictures of my cats. <laughs> they never get tired of being adorable. So, you know, and the internet loves cat pictures. Yeah. You want to tell me about your cats? I have four cats right now. <laughs> um... So, uh, okay, the oldest, the senior cat is Emily Cat, uh, who showed up at our door uh, when my older child was a kindergartner and was like, hi, I live here now. Um, we had three other cats at the time, and so we were a little hesitant to take her word for it that she was now our cat. Um, but she was very <laughs> persistent and extremely friendly, and so uh, eventually she convinced us. And uh, she's named Emily because um, my oldest child's best kindergarten friend's name was Emily. Molly wanted to name the cat after her friend. Um, and I was like, oh, sure, fine, that's fine. And then we realized our mistake when um, we would yell, Emily, get off the table at the cat. <laughs> and the child would freeze looking terrified because she wasn't on the table. Why were we yelling at her? Um, and then there's, uh, okay, so that was Emily Cat. And then we had um, three cats that were senior to her when she arrived, but they've all 
died of old age since. Um, and then, so we've got Balto, who's an enormous black cat who um, is constantly hungry and gets into everything. Um, we have to rubber band our cabinets shut because otherwise he will wow. bat them open and steal uncooked lentils out and try to eat them. <laughs> That's so specific. Well, the, anything, he'll, anything, but the lentils were the one that I was like, you know, mm-hmm. you're, you're, um, you're smart enough to get into the cabinets, but not smart enough to figure out what in here is actually like edible food. Right. Um, and then, uh, fluffy pants, who's this incredibly pretty, she's probably the prettiest cat we've ever had. She's calico, mostly white, very, very fluffy. Um, and, uh, when she arrived, she was the newbie and like um she like quickly sussed out that Emily was the was the queen of the household and was like I will you know I will I will submit myself to you I will prostrate before your greatness oh oh queen um and then Balto was like and you look like you might be interested in playing <laughs> and so those she and Balto are buddies and they play and they snuggle and Emily um Emily is is important and doesn't snuggle with anybody except the humans. And then the fourth cat was uh, a feral kitten found under a friend's porch and adopted. And he has been difficult. He was not socialized well. Um, we we finally put him on Prozac because he wouldn't use the litter box. Um, and uh, he lives in Kira, my younger child's bedroom, because he does not get along with the other cats. Mm. And because he was socialized as a feral um, and then orphaned. Uh, he doesn't fight like a normal house cat. Like most of the time okay. when house cats fight, there's like, it's sort of like when siblings fight. There's usually some, there's, there's some, some restraint. restraint. Yeah. And whereas, whereas Spotty really, I think, thinks his life is in danger. So he comes out like all claws, like no holds barred. Mm-hmm. And he scares the bejesus out of the other cats. Um, even though he's tiny, um, he's like a tiny ball of fury and knives and uh so if he's out in the rest of the house the other cats all flee to the basement and hide (laughs) um and uh so he has to live in he has to live in a room separate from the rest so so those are my current my current kitties um and you met a couple of the uh studio cats yes Um, they're very sweet I'll, i'll summarize them by saying that all three of my cats are orange and uh they're pretty dumb (laughs) Yeah, cats are really a mixed bag where intelligence is concerned. <laughs> there are cats that can open cabinets. I've had several cats that could open cabinets. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are cats where it's like if you hide their food under a newspaper, they're like, where did it go? Yeah, these, these ones have figured out like if if I don't latch the door to the front porch really carefully, they can get out there. Yeah. They can't get back in. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's their level. Yeah. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Extra Dimension. I have been your host, Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter at Ian R. Buck. The Extra Dimension is a production of The Nexus TV. We are a network of technology-focused podcasts based in the Twin Cities. This episode of The Extra Dimension is released under a Creative Commons attribution license, so feel free to use any part of it that you like, as long as you link back to the original page, which is thenexus.tv slash TED48. If you would like to discuss this episode with other listeners, please go to our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv. And if you are willing and able to support us financially as we continue to make technology-focused content, you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash thenexustv. If you have ideas for future episodes of The Extra Dimension, uh, feel free to contact us. Our email address is thenexustv at gmail.com. And join us next month on The Extra Dimension for an episode all about podcasts and the best ways to listen to them. Until next time, have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from from the the Technological technological Convergence. Real quick thing before you go, it's almost time for the annual Project for Awesome, and the Nexus will be participating again. 
So what the heck is the Project for Awesome? Uh, the Project for Awesome is a community-driven annual fundraiser for charities that was started in 2007 by Hank and John Green. They do a 48-hour live stream gathering donations from the community, and then the donations are split between charities that are chosen by the community. So, how does the community choose? Well, online creators, such as yours truly, promote a charity that they think is doing important work and encourage their audience to go and vote for that charity on the Project for Awesome website. And we here at the Nexus chose... The Electronic Frontier Foundation. Now, to explain what the Electronic Frontier Foundation does, I think there's no better place to look than just to read from their mission statement. When freedoms in the networked world come under attack, the Electronic Frontier Foundation is the first line of defense. EFF broke new ground when it was founded in 1990, well before the internet was on most people's radar, and continues to confront cutting-edge issues defending free speech, privacy, innovation, and consumer rights today. From the beginning, EFF has championed the public interest in every critical battle affecting digital rights. EFF fights for freedom primarily in the courts, bringing and defending lawsuits even when that means taking on the U.S. government or large corporations. By mobilizing more than 50,000 concerned citizens through our action center, EFF beats back bad legislation. In addition to advising policymakers, EFF educates the press and public. As we were discussing which charity we wanted to support, all of the Nexus hosts were on board with choosing the EFF. Here are Ryan and Brian's thoughts on the subject. Hey everyone, this is Ryan. You might have heard technology is important these days. The Electronic Frontier Foundation's goal, its mission, is to raise funds for education, lobbying, and litigation in areas relating to digital speech, freedom, and privacy. All of those things are things that I believe in. And I hope you believe in those things too. My role in this is to help create great software to help society. The Electronic Frontier Foundation's role in this is to make sure technology stays great for society. The Electronic Frontier Foundation is one of the best examples that I can think of of an organization that continuously fights for the user. They center their goals around freedom of speech, privacy, creativity and innovation, transparency, international and security. They've helped create tools like HTTPS Everywhere and the Let's Encrypt CertBot, as well as taken issues to court against the federal government, the FCC, and the world's largest entertainment and electronics companies. The EFF website is quite extensive and is filled with guides, news, and other posts on all of the topics that they support. I think a digital rights foundation like the EFF is one of the most important groups that we can support to help every user of technology in today's digital world. All right, time for your calls to action. What do I want you to do? Uh, number one, tune into the Project for Awesome live stream from noon December 6th to noon December 8th Eastern Time. Two, vote for the EFF on the Project for Awesome website. And three, donate some money directly to the EFF and or to the Project for Awesome. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good one.